what is the role that university leaders and administrators should play in these very contentious cases? Mm -hmm. Well, clearly in the last um, decade or so, uh, the foci of attention of attacks on certain kinds of speech on campus, but perhaps just simply ability of faculty members to conduct their work on campus has been on the Middle East uh, Studies arena. When I was uh, provost of the university, there were many, many uh, attacks from outside of the university on Edward Said, uh, who was uh, a very uh, distinguished literary critic, of course, but was also an, out, uh, an outspoken advocate for the Palestinian uh, people. Uh, on a number of occasions, I would get tens of thousands of emails calling for uh, the university to uh, abandon Edward Said, to fire him. I was, um, oh, the alumni would communicate with me and, and tell me that I'll never give another dime to the university if we don't fire Edward Said. Now, I, at one point after many, many of these occurrences, I actually asked the development office about whether or not these people actually gave to the university. And 97% of them turned out that the next time that they gave would be the first time that they ever gave to the university. But that isn't really the essential point. The point was that I felt that uh, Said was representing certainly a point of view. There was a point of view very, very different from that that existed at Columbia and many other universities. Uh, these ideas should be not only fought out in that marketplace of ideas, but it, there was the responsibility of good leadership at universities to defend the idea of free inquiry, to defend the idea of the freedom to be able to have this kind of discourse and not to cut off debate. Now, I stopped being provost in, in 2003. Some of the incidents that have come uh, to the forefront about Middle Eastern studies at Columbia came after I was uh, a provost. And, um, you know, to some extent they were handled well, and other uh, times here I think not as well as they, as they might have been. I do believe there is an essential role for academic leaders to take a very strong stand defending free inquiry and academic freedom, but also to educate the American people as to why academic freedom isn't simply a privilege, uh, sort of an, a garment worn by, uh, by professors, but is more important than that, it is, after all, the underpinnings of so much about the structure and values of great universities. And without it, we could not build great universities. If you look at probably the, the most significant impediment to universities in China from becoming truly great universities, it's not clear that they truly understand the nature of free inquiry and academic freedom. They claim that they do, but in their actions, they often betray it. The same thing was true, of course, uh, during the period of Lysenko in, in Russian uh, biology. And we can give you many, many examples of this. Unfortunately, I'm afraid, courage is not a trait that's found in great abundance in our society, and it's not found in great abu abundance among academic leaders in the United States. I think that's extremely unfortunate. During the post-9-11 period, when the USA Patriot Act was passed, uh, when the Bioterrorism Defense Act was passed, there were very few academic leaders who were standing up, as Robert Hutchins did, for example, um, during the McCarthy period, and gave a civics lesson and a lesson about the value of university discourse to the American public and to state legislators. There have been very few who have been willing to do that. I think that is very unfortunate. I think there's an important role for academic leaders to defend these core values and these principles, and all too few do.